Welcome to Had to Be There, the podcast that allows you to explore the world's greatest destinations through the stories of those who have been there. Here to ignite the wanderlust within, your host and favorite travel planner, Kelly Acevedo. Namaste, fellow Wanderlusters. Welcome back to the Had to Be There podcast. I'm your host, Kelly, and this is episode 68. In today's episode, we are going to be chatting with my new friend, Mike France. Mike is an author and world traveler, and he is so entertaining and funny and kind. And I cannot wait for you guys to meet him. He's going to be sharing lots of stories from his life and some of the silly things that have happened to him along the way. But before we get into that conversation, I think we have some news okay, to chat about. Okay, okay, okay. So much news from the world. So hey, put your sound up. You know why? I think it's time for our weekly roundup. Weekly roundup. Yes, that's right. Welcome back to the Weekly Roundup. This is your go-to source for all the latest travel news and promos from Disney and beyond that you may have missed last week. I've got quite the lineup for you guys today, so let's jump right in. First of all, a bittersweet announcement came out a few weeks back for all of the Star Wars fans out there. The Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser experience will be permanently closing later this year. While we may still be mourning its loss, I can't help but wonder, what do you think Walt Disney World should do with this amazing Star Wars-themed hotel space? I really want to hear your thoughts, so put on your Imagineers caps and send me your ideas. You can send those via email at podcast at hadtobethere.net or on any social media, so I'm going to add this to my stories later this week, and I really want to hear your feedback on this. If you're not familiar with the Galactic Star Cruiser experience, you can go back to episode 55 with my girl Megs and hear all about it. Now let's dive into some incredible offers. If you're planning a Disney Cruise Line adventure to Hawaii on the Disney Wonder, have I got a treat for you. You can now extend your vacation with a two to seven night stay at the incredible Aulani Resort. And the best part, you'll save 20% on select rooms when you add a pre-stay or post-stay to your Disney Cruise Line booking. Do not miss on this fantastic opportunity to create unforgettable memories in paradise. Calling all the California residents... Get ready for a truly golden opportunity at the Disneyland Resort. For a limited time, you can visit the theme parks for as low as $83 per day with the purchase of a three-day, one-park-per-day ticket. Experience the magic of Disneyland Park and Disney California Adventure Park and immerse yourself in the Disney 100 celebration with reimagined lands, dazzling nighttime spectaculars, and beloved parades. With options to suit every schedule, it's time to make your dreams come true. Hey, have you been looking for a VIP beach getaway? Look no further than Discovery Cove. Picture yourself swimming with dolphins, snorkeling with colorful fish and rays, hand-feeding exotic birds, and relaxing on pristine beaches. And the cherry on top? Save up to 30% on your 2023 reservation. This offer ends on June 25th, so act now, don't miss out. Contact your favorite Academy Travel Affiliate for more information. Ahoy, adventure seekers! I've got some last-minute deals from Royal Caribbean just for you. These deals are going, going, gone, so you need to act by, I think, the 14th, which is tomorrow, to take advantage of these prices. 
They are offering Freedom of the Seas, a three night Bahamas, and Perfect Day Cruise starting at just $4.49. Or set sail on the Mariner of the Seas for an eight night Bermuda and Perfect Day Cruise with prices starting at $6.09. These deals will not last, so you need to act now, like right now. Hit pause, shoot me your little email, and then come back. I'm ready. And finally, I've got some exclusive promotions from Virgin Voyages. If you're planning a Mediterranean voyage in 2023, you can save up to $1,200 in airfare credits, along with free drinks. Sailors looking for Caribbean adventures can enjoy $500 off select voyages through April 2024. Plus, again, free drinks. Florida residents, you're in luck too. They've got something for you. There are tons of promos right now with Virgin Voyages. I'm not going to go through all of them because we would be here all day. So please reach out to myself or another Academy Travel Affiliate. If you don't have one, let me know and I'll connect you with somebody local if you'd like. And they'll be able to fill you in on all of the Virgin Voyages promos. Don't forget, Virgin Voyages is the adults only cruise line. So if you're looking for a break from kids, this is the one for you. So that wraps up this week's weekly roundup. I hope that you found this exciting and inspiring. More details are available on all of these promos, and there are so many more happening right now. I will be back next and every week for more travel news and promos from Disney and beyond right here on the weekly roundup. Embark on an unforgettable journey through a land where ancient wonders stand tall, vibrant cultures thrive, and breathtaking landscapes unfold. Lose yourself in bustling cities bursting with colors and flavors. Explore mystical mountains and dense jungles teeming with wildlife. Immerse yourself in a tapestry of traditions and festivals that celebrate unity. Indulge in a culinary adventure that ignites your taste buds and discover the diverse landscapes that captivate the soul. Get ready to be spellbound. This is India. Mike, welcome to the Had to Be There podcast. I'm so excited to chat with you today. I'm thrilled to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Before we jump in, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little about you? Sure. Well, as I hope you'll find out during this discussion, I'm just your average overweight, middle-class American white guy, where <laughs> bad things happen to me about any time I leave home. Um, prof professionally, I've been uh, an enrollment professional in higher education since 1989, starting as a entry-level position, working my way up into three vice presidency roles, and now I serve as a consultant and interim vice president for places around the United States. Through that uh, profession, I've been allowed to travel domestically and internationally quite a bit, and uh, we've tacked on plenty of personal adventures as well, but uh, it, uh, that, that professional role kind of defines many of my stories. Um, that uh, wouldn't have happened without the, the grace of my employers and their willingness to fund uh, my misadventures. <laughs> I love it. I can't wait to hear more about that. Where are you from originally, Mike? I was born in Storm, excuse me, I was born in Mount Vernon, Iowa, but have spent the majority of my adulthood across two different interrupted stints in Storm Lake, Iowa. And that's from uh, where I am speaking you, to you today. Oh, very nice. Did you have the opportunity to travel much as a kid or did most of your travel happen once you were working? 
Um, we took just a few vacations domestically when I was uh, growing up. Um, got out to Colorado once. Grandpa flew us out to Carson City, Nevada. That was my only plane ride until I hit college. And then oh, in college, wow. I was fortunate enough to do a three weeks of a European uh, alcohol-induced uh, class and uh, then more fortunate to spend an entire semester in Germany as a junior in college. And that oh, really nice. set off the, the burning desire to see more of the world. That was where you were bitten by the travel bug. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, I love it. What made you choose uh, Germany for your semester abroad? Well, life serendipitous at times. I had a great high school German teacher. And uh, so I took four years there and I was, went off to college to be a political science major, which I succeeded in. But I found out because I was had enough background, I could jump into uh, the German major and was given credit for 101 and 102 level courses. So I already had six credits. I got uh, 18 credits for studying abroad. So there's uh, you know, 24 credits between those two things. And you only needed 30 credits for a major. So I took a semester here and there, and it all worked out. Ultimately oh, met the excellent. woman who became my wife, who was part of our study abroad group. So I, I you know, I think it was uh, one of the best investments I ever made. Oh, I love that. That's so sweet. <laughs> so tell me where it is that you're taking us today. Today, if there's time for just one story, we're going to go to the, the beautiful and but ugly, fantastic and fetid, noteworthy and nauseating country of India. <laughs> there's a description if I've ever heard one. <laughs> and it's all true. I love that country in so many ways, and it bothers me to the umpteenth <laughs> degree in many ways. So tell me when this particular trip took place and what brought you to this region? Mm-hmm. So I was the director of admissions at the time at Univista University in Storm Lake, Iowa. And my boss, who I think had been there before, decided that he'd had enough of that experience. So, Mike, why don't you go instead this time? And being, you know, young, naive and willing to go anywhere, and it sounded kind of exotic. Yeah, John, I'll go to India for two and a half, three weeks. Who wouldn't? I mean, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. What little did I know? Right. <laughs> so you mentioned um, before we started recording that at the time of this trip, you were more of an inexperienced traveler. Uh, so this was, I imagine, towards the beginning of your um, extensive experience in forced travel. <laughs> and sir, it was my first professional international work experience. Oh, wow. So you must have been pumped. I mean, leading oh, yeah. up to it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I so should have maybe me, done a little more research and right. asked a few more questions, but yeah, I was excited. So take me, take me through this had to be their experience that you had in India. So a little bit you need to know about me. Uh, I was not a very good flyer for many, many years. Mm. Uh, very nervous, which meant even though I was given a business class or what we call more today, first class ticket to India to fly from I think we went direct from Chicago to Delhi. Um, I didn't sleep much. I was wound up. Every bump of the plane would jerk me alert. And uh, so I was I was pretty exhausted. I think the last flight was something like 14 straight hours in the air. Ooh. Not enough beer served on the plane to allow me to calm down and sleep or anything like oh, that. Yeah. So, you know, you're up for 24, 30 hours straight. And the plan here was to land in Delhi overnight there and then catch a morning flight to the final destination or the first real destination of the trip, I think was in Hyderabad in the, in the Southern portion of the country. And so that's as, that's the backdrop as uh, I cross the ponds, if you will, mm -hmm. to, to get to India. And as I learned on this trip, I think it was every single airport. I was in and out of like a half dozen of them there the squalid uh, camps of the what we would term homeless, I don't know if they would define themselves as homeless, surrounded mm -hmm. every airport I flew into. Oh, so wow. you just see abject poverty as you're coming in for landing, you know, the wood shacks, the corrugated tin roofs, um, 
people cooking on stoves outside their, their little huts and, and what have you. And India, though a glorious, wonderful country, does not invest in opulent uh, structures such as airports. They're in many ways, at least in the times I was there, uh, big open air hangers, if you will. Oh, wow. Um, this is a sidebar, you know, when I'd fly out of any airport, I didn't understand the language, of course, or anything, but I could get to my gate and then there'd be some sort of announcement and everybody would stand up and walk towards the door. I guess that's us. <laughs> but anyway, back to the story. So I get there, get through security very seamlessly and you exit the airport and you were then thrust into this kind of open air environment with uh, kiosks, I guess is the uh, kindest term I could give. You might think of card tables uh, stacked next to each other with people behind them and cardboard signs saying, can I take you somewhere? Do you need money? Et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, think back to the, to the uh, mid nineties, we didn't have the, uh, the credit card situations that were worldwide mm -hmm. accepted and all that. So we had traveler's checks. Mm. That, was, that was high end sophistication. Right. <laughs> and I needed some, you know, local currency, rupees as they are mm -hmm. in India. So I went up to the kiosk that said money exchange and I wrote out traveler's checks, I think in the amount of $200. Now, I had not done any research to know what the exchange rate is or anything like that or what the currency looks like. And so, you know, the 11-year-old wannabe banker who was serving me hands me <laughs> two stacks. I Literally, they're four inches high each with these big metal staples holding them together through the middle of each one and hands them across the desk to me for everybody around me to see. Right. <laughs> I'm like, son of a gun. Okay, this is not going to fit in my wallet. <laughs> right. So we, we bury them quickly into my suitcase bag. You know, one of those fancy ones that folds over so you can take a suit and not wrinkle it. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's just shoved in there as quick as I possibly can. So now I'm faced with the task of I have the name and the address of the hotel I'm going to, but how do I get there? Mm. Again, no advantage of Uber, Lyft. Yeah. Didn't really know what the taxi situation was, but that's, you know, that was what you did in that day is you would find a taxi. Right. So I go to the stand of the taxi providers and he says, the guy behind the counter says, see that 12 year old street urchin over there by the door? He's waving at you. Go follow him. What? What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Seems legit. Okay. Seems legit. Maybe that's just how it works in Delhi. I don't maybe, know. Maybe. No basis of comparison. So I follow this this uh, young enterprising individual mm -hmm. out of now the safe confines of the open air kiosk services. Right. And we're quickly walking beyond the airport beyond the street lights and it's a little dark now at you know whatever it was nine ten o'clock at night mm -hmm. i'm like i hope he knows where we're going oh god and after you know two or three minutes we start approaching this young group i'm sure of upstanding fine citizens of delhi you know you could also define them as a street gang i don't know oh, <laughs> they're just <laughs> hanging out <laughs> they are just hanging out around these cars. And there are two cars parked nose to nose in front of us as we approach. And this street gang then literally pushes these two cars backwards while two others push another car forward. I don't know if they were protecting it from something. I don't know. I don't know. What? So my young man says, let me take your bags and you can get in. I'm like, I don't think I want you taking my bags. I have, you know, eight inches of toilet paper that they call rupees in one of my bags. So that's how you're going to get paid if I actually get to where I'm supposed to go. Right. So I 
put my bags next to me in the back seat and away we go. And he's an amiable, fine guy. I think he's sitting on the Delhi phone book or maybe his own stack of rupees because he's not that tall. <laughs> but, you know, we exit the airport paved roads. And the next thing I know, we are on dirt roads. Oh, God. And all around us are, you know, cattle because they're sacred animals in India roaming yeah. about right. chickens and camels and donkeys and you, you know, I didn't see my first Cobra street farmer that day, but I'm sure they were just sleeping at the time waiting for the morning. Right. But <laughs> all of these animals roaming about, uh, this was not the ghetto of uh, the airport, but these were very, very modest shacks, homes, and sure. people were squatting around fires outside. And I'm like, you know, this isn't civilization as I know it. I, I've been to major metropolitan areas uh, since, like Tokyo and Seoul, and yet you didn't have dirt roads. And right. so I'm thinking to myself, this is where I get rolled, and this is where I die, and nobody yep. will ever know the difference. Right. But as I've learned in my travels, 99% of the people in this world are really, really good. And I just try to avoid the 1%. Yeah. And this guy turned out to be really good. And he got me ultimately to this hotel. And as I'm exiting and paying him from my stapled stack of rupees, he says, do you need a ride back to the airport tomorrow? I said, sure. Um, how does this work? He says, well, I'm just going to go over here and sleep in my car tonight. You tell the guy outside the hotel, here's my card. You just have him call my name in the morning. That's a hustler. That's a guy who's not going to give up a ride to anybody else. You're right. And I'm not thinking one moment this is going to happen. He's going to go out and get another ride, whatever. I'm going to be stuck in the morning. I'm going to miss my flight, but whatever. So I go into the hotel um, carrying another one of his business cards so I can remember to hand it to the, the, the speaker in the morning. Right. I get checked in and get the key to my room. I am ready finally. I get a bed. I get to actually relax. I don't have to fly for another 10 hours. Life is good. Yeah. Walk into my hotel room. And you might know, and your listeners might know, you know, India is a rather uh, humid country most of the year. Hot, humid. Not the place I would put shag carpeting into a hotel room. But, you know, I wasn't their interior designer either. Right. And it is squishy. It doesn't sound right. I don't want to test it with my bare feet, but I just need clean sheets, quiet bed. But I'm hungry, and I notice how nice. They've put this really nice bowl of fresh fruit in the room for me. That's very sweet of them. This must be at least a two-star hotel. Right, nice touch. <laughs> and I go to grab a banana and an orange or something like that, and this cloud of fruit flies rises from the fruit bowl no thank you <laughs> nope nope i'm not that hungry i'll find <laughs> find something at the friendly kiosk street vendor in the morning right, it'll right. all be good mm. so i you know it appears at least the sheets are clean the bed feels comfortable and i lay down for a good night's sleep at which point the monkeys outside the window are, um, I hope it was consensual because it sounds like they were having monkey intercourse. Oh, no. um, I hope those were noises of joy and not uh, pain. Oh, but, no. Uh, they have the stamina unlike anything I know because this went on for an awful long time. Oh, my God. <laughs> Needless to say, <laughs> I didn't sleep all that well that night. Oh, no. So I get up, I shower, do the best I can, go down to the front door, and there's this guy next to a loudspeaker, as I was told there would be, and I hand him my young man's card, and over this outdoor loudspeaker, he says, you know, this is who's wanted, and I'll be darned, my little buddy has slept in his car all night, and he picks <laughs> me up and hauls me all back to the airport where I... Oh. Fly without incident to Hyderabad. 
Now, a couple tail end uh, misses about this story. The, the, the recruitment trip went really relatively well, uneventful. It was fine. I ate more curry than I ever want to eat in my life. And, <laughs> you know, all the good Indian food. And it is good. Don't get me wrong. It's very, yeah. very good. Not heavy on the meat, but that's okay. They're a lot skinnier than I was and probably healthier than I am and was at the time. Sure. <laughs> and we're getting towards the tail end of the trip. I think I'm in my last city. And being young, dumb, and American, I said, they actually have hamburgers on the menu in this, you know, lovely two and a half star hotel. Mm. So I'll have one of those. I haven't had beef since I left. Never, you know, reminding myself that cows are sacred. Right. <laughs> and so whatever I ate, I doubt it was beef in retrospect. And if yep. it was, <laughs> it was not from a healthy animal. Oh. And you can imagine what happens next. Oh, no. Everything that is unholy in my body is exited from every hole in my body possible except no. my ears, you know? Oh, no. And so this, this goes on for a few hours, in the middle of which my boss back home in Iowa, the hotel phone rings 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he says, how you doing? <laughs> not, not so good. How you doing? And can we go get this over with quickly before I have to exit stage left? Right. And I just want to let you know I resigned my job today. Didn't want you to find out any other way. What? Son of a, huh? Uh, <laughs> I, I like you. You're a good boss. And I'm an Indian. I'm sick. And you're the one exiting stage left right now? Oh. Not good, John. Not good. See oh. you in a couple, three days if I live through this. Right. The Had to Be There podcast is brought to you by Vacations by Kelly, where your host becomes your travel agent. As a proud affiliate of Academy Travel, Kelly specializes in Disney destinations and can help with all non-Disney excursions worldwide as well. When you book with Kelly, you're getting much more than a travel agent. You're getting a personalized concierge level travel partner. And the best part? Her services are completely free. It's true. So when you're ready to make your next travel dream a reality, Vacations by Kelly is ready to make it happen. Visit hadtobethere.net slash vacations to get started. So finally, it's time to go, go back home, back in Delhi, and I go to check in. And this was, you know, we didn't have smartphones. You didn't have apps where you did this. You went to the counter, you checked your luggage, you got your paper boarding pass. And so that's what I'm doing. And I get my boarding pass and I look at it and I'm not sitting up in business class. I'm sitting in the back of the plane. And I expressed my concern and displeasure politely. Mm -hmm. And they said, sorry, that's what it says. I said, I need to talk to your manager. And I started to climb the rungs of various management levels until finally one of them says, well, our records indicate that you sold your first class ticket to get money back for your trip. And so you're by your own design, you're in the back of the bus. Oh, what? That's so, you know, there's graft and all sorts of stuff that goes on even today at places. And I'm sure one of the employees sold my ticket <gasps> to somebody else. And so, then Mike had a short fuse moment. Sure. I wasn't sitting in the back of the bus. <laughs> I, we paid for it. I deserved it. And long story longer, I ended up behind the counter in some cluttered office having an exchange of ideas with the top dog who was there. Oh. <laughs> and, and I don't exactly remember whether I signed a paper saying I'd never come back to India again or whether I gave him 100 toilet paper rupees. But <laughs> the end result is I got my first class ticket back. Yay. And I, I got back home uh, to do more fun travel like that one. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love it. So that's quite a first experience uh, to India. <laughs> Have you been back since? 
I don't believe I've been back to India since. Do you think that you might visit in a non-work type <laughs> setting? Not a chance. No. <laughs> been there, done that. It was great. It was awful. Yeah. Uh, it's a big, big world out there. I'd rather go somewhere new, frankly. Fair enough. Now, how many um, countries or regions would you say you've been able to visit? Pfft. I think <laughs> once upon a time I counted that. I mean, much of Europe I've been to, at least mm -hmm. Western Europe. Uh, much of Southeast Asia, with the exception, oddly, of China. Interesting. Um, <laughs> one trip to Africa, to Rwanda with my daughter. That was wow. a heck of a lot of fun. So I don't know. Let's call it 25, 30-ish. Yeah, that's awesome. But when I say that, you know, business travel, it's not like I get to do all the tourist things. Mm. Uh, so, for instance, when I tell you I've been to Hong Kong, I've been to the airport and one hotel. Mm. And then back to the airport. Yeah, yeah. Not as much fun, I guess. <laughs> so let me ask you about uh, some of your other travel, if I may. Sure. Is there any place that you've visited that continues to call you back? If there wasn't this whole big white world out there that you still wanted to see, which place would you go to over and over and over if you could? Yeah. Um, well, this, this melds into our future plans, in fact. Separately from me, my, my wife has traveled a fair amount. Um, and she has fallen in love with this little village in County Kerry in Ireland called Sneem, S-N-E-E-M. For those who travel uh, Ireland, it's in the knot of the Ring of Kerry on the West Coast, if you will. It's a village of about 300. Wow. And the, the people are as kind and generous as you could ever imagine. We've, she's, she takes groups of her college students every other year. Sometimes I come for a week at the end of that. Sometimes in off years, we go separately. But oh, wow. uh, it, it calls her name every day of every week of every month of every year. Mm -hmm. And oh, so we will that. gladly spend some of our retirement, significant parts of our retirement out there. Oh, that's amazing. Great answer. <laughs> Thanks. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Which place that you visited has had the richest um, nightlife? <laughs> uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Ooh, great answer. That's, that's a new one for us. <laughs> well, you, you'll read a fascinating story about it in my book if you wish. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How about uh, which place has had the friendliest locals? Um, Sneem, Ireland, hands down. Yeah. Um, but as I said, my wife's been there a lot. Sometimes this has happened more than once. It, you know, there's one kind of semi-main two-lane road that goes to this little village. And uh, the hotel we stay in is one end of the village from downtown. And so we walk there. And we'll be walking on our first or second morning from the hotel to downtown for lunch. And people will park their cars in the middle of the street, come over and give my wife a hug and say, welcome back. Oh, my gosh. I love it. Oh, that's so special. It is. Um, do you collect any kind of souvenirs or do you have a favorite keepsake that you've collected along the way? No, I do just the opposite. I eat and drink my way through the country. That's how I experience it and remember it. Nice. <laughs> so to that end, uh, what is the best local cuisine that you've tried in your travels? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I lived with a host family in Southwest Germany. Um, in, uh, and whatever Frau Weiss cooked was my favorite of the day. You know, and it was a lot of the traditional stuff. She taught me how to make homemade spetzla, which is a pasta type thing, noodle yeah. thing. Uh, plenty of, you know, the, the traditional Wiener schnitzel that you've heard and read about and experienced perhaps yourself. Sure. It was just a lot of cabbage stuff, cabbage dishes, not just sauerkraut, but various cabbage dishes. And she could do no wrong as far as I was concerned. And Oftentimes, she'd, as I'd go off to school, she'd hand me back when it was the mark and not the euro, 
here's five or 10 marks, stop by this booth at their version of the farmer's market and hand them this list of uh -huh. little herbs and what have you that she yeah. would, I had no idea what they were, but they tasted <laughs> really good and who am I to question? I mean, yeah, <laughs> if it ain't broke. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, I love that. Mike, what is currently at the top of your travel bucket list? Yeah, um, one international and one and a half domestic. Okay. For whatever reason, I want to go to Costa Rica. Oh, I've seen enough choice. shows, great enough yeah. articles. The wildlife seems incredible. Mm -hmm. The fauna seems beyond beautiful. I planned one trip. It wasn't able to work out. We just haven't pulled the trigger on that one yet. Yeah. Oh, that's and then domestically. Yeah, yeah. Domestically, although I've been in the vast majority of states, I've never spent any time in the Northwest part of the U.S. Would love to see the national parks out there. And then we need absolutely have to get to Alaska, whether that's okay. ourselves driving it or taking, you know, the uh, cruise line up in, in past Denali. Um, that is very high on the list. And if we could combine those two yeah. yeah, that might be my first retirement trip is get up and go, darling. We're going to spend yeah. three weeks and we're going to do this. Oh, that'll be a great way to kick off retirement. Exactly. <laughs> so tell me a little bit uh, about your book, which has one of the greatest titles that I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so backstory to the book. For, you know, I joined Facebook in 2008. And that became the place where when I had a, a misadventure with travel, I would just quickly put a post up about it. Mm -hmm. I didn't think anything of it, but it over time it became, I guess, my Facebook brand. Right. And people would comment like, you know, that's really funny. Oh, I'm so sorry. And ultimately, you should write a book about this. I'd never considered it. Yeah. Um. And then one day, the, the publisher, Olive Publishing, is owned by a former high school classmate of mine. And we're Facebook friends. We haven't seen each other since high school graduation. Sure, sure. And a year and a half or so ago, he reached out. He'd read he was drinking a cup of coffee one Saturday morning. I'd had some terrible mishap the night before. And he spit out his coffee. He was laughing so hard at my expense. <laughs> and he got on Facebook Messenger and says, we need to talk. You have to write this book. Yes. I said, okay. How the hell do you do this? Yeah. And so I started by scrolling through whatever it was, 15 years of Facebook history, cutting and pasting every travel related post I'd put on there. Wow. Put it just cut and paste into a Word document. When I was done, that was over 5,500 words. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and That's so I started to, yeah, I started to organize them under themes. And then I started to think about uh, both experiences prior to 2008, of which I had plenty, mm -hmm. experiences that I didn't dare put on Facebook for fear that my parents would read them. <laughs> There's a lot of self disclosure. <laughs> and ultimately, my mom. Uh, did read it. And I think what her comment was, I didn't know this much about you. <laughs> Fortunately, I was raised under the mantra of my parents. We will not ask a question to which we cannot accept the answer. I like it. I like it. So I, 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 think, I think I'm still in the will in spite of all the self-disclosure <laughs> and uh, debauchery and, and whatnot that fills the pages of the book titled Don't Travel with Mike. <laughs> I love it. Um, do you have a uh, a favorite story from Don't Travel with Mike? I have tons. The one I gave you is is one of the absolute favorites. Uh, how much time do we have for for another one? <laughs> Seriously, because I've got you, one ready to go. Oh yeah, yeah. Give us another quick one. I'll take it. All right. I think you know. I, as we led up to this, you, your your audience likes exotic locations, correct? 
we do. <laughs> so this one takes place in uh, the country of Rwanda in Africa. Right. And the, the backstory is we have, a, I call him my pseudo son. He's not biologically ours. He's not legally ours, but he's been a member of our family since his freshman year in college. And oh, Christian was born, was born in Rwanda, survived along with his family, the genocide when he was, I think, wow. four years old, something like that. Oh, wow. And he came to the U.S. to, to finish high school and get his college degree and, and uh, start his career. Mm. And so we have a biological daughter. Christian quickly became uh, her brother. And when it came time for Hannah to choose a study abroad location, she says, I'm going to Rwanda. Oh. Wonderful. Oh. And... Everything was great, except for the fact that the topic of study, which is admirable, was genocide. Mm. And for a semester, these 20, 21-year-old kids learned about the worst atrocities of humankind. And you can imagine the emotional scarring that yeah. costs. Absolutely. And she came back, and to her credit, immediately went into therapy where some of her classmates didn't and were ultimately diagnosed with PTSD. Wow. So fast forward a couple of years and Hannah's been selected to enter the Peace Corps. Oh, wow. And she came to me one day and she said, Dad, before I go into the Peace Corps, I got to go back to Rwanda and, and prove to myself I can come back healthy. Oh, wow. I said, oh, what's a dad going to say at that point? Right. Exactly. You know, how quickly, how quickly can I buy the tickets? Yeah. And Christian's going to be there. We get to meet his family. Oh, it's going to be great. And we do all of that. And it's fantastic. It's wonderful. But there was one area in uh, Rwanda that she had not gone to. And I'll, I'll butcher the name of it. It's the Ninjni Forest. And all she right. wanted to go there. And so we, we've done the capital city of Kigali. She rented us, you know, all these little motorbikes driven by four-year-olds who give you, uh, you know, oversized helmets and tell you to hang on and you'll be fine. And we've gone through <laughs> all the busy streets of Kigali. So what could be worse? Fair. So we hire Christian's mother's driver to take us a couple, three hours south to this forest area where Hannah has made reservations in this bungalow resort place. Perfect. We get there. The driver has to ask directions as to where this resort place is. Finally gets them. And next thing you know, we're at the bottom of the steepest hill I've ever seen. And their idea of a gravel road is made out of stone that look like bowling balls. Oh, my gosh. And he's like, <laughs> you're not paying me enough to take you up that. <laughs> so Hannah, might, Hannah, who spoke a little of the language, was able to... I think give him enough money to buy another set of shock absorbers or something like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes us up there and it is lovely. It's right on top of the, the big hill, small mountain, call it what you will. Yeah. And they tell us, you know, at reception, just sit down. You've had a trip. Here's a nice warm wet washcloth. Why don't you clean yourself a little bit? I just kind of like to go to my room. <laughs> but no, you we're went in Rwanda and then they bring us a tea service and a little snack. Oh I, I mean we're we're getting to be an hour in. Oh my god. This is this is weird. <laughs> and then finally they say, Let us take us take you to your bungalow. Well, what they've done in the meantime is start a fire in the fireplace. So it's nice and warm for the cool evening. Oh. And uh so that was, was wonderful. The next day we go down and Hannah is all about doing this canopy tour hike. Oh, wow. Now, mind you, I am petrified of heights. Oh, no. <laughs> Just petrified. Oh, no. Hannah, no. <laughs> but we have to exercise her demons. Nothing about exercising mine. Right, right, right. <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> so we go, there's this forest service office. We go there. We hire a guide for the day. And off into the jungle we go. And, you know, he says, oh, hear that? That's a monkey. 
and you strain your eyes and maybe you pretend you see a monkey or you don't. <laughs> and you see beautiful birds and all sorts of things. The forest is gorgeous, lush, green. And we're not too far into the hike and there's blood on the trail. Mm -mm. I'm like, <laughs> what would that? Goes, uh -uh. I don't know. <laughs> Looks like the bob a bobcat must have killed something. Bobcat's on the same trail I'm on, and that blood isn't dry yet. Oh, you know, you know how how big are these bobcats? Oh my I mean, god! You know, are we talking saber tooth tiger? What are we talking? Right. <laughs> but on we march. Ne'er did we see the bobcat, nor the consumptive kill from the from the critter, whatever it may have been. And we get to the first canopy walk, and I can see from where we are to the end of it. It's only a hundred yards. I can do this. Right. And I took a picture from where we were standing at that moment. And if you've seen, you know, the movie version of going to heaven where you're walking into the light, the way that sun was positioned, it was like walking. I'm like, okay, if this is where it ends, at least I'm guided along my path. Yeah. Yeah. I had a good run. <laughs> exactly. And you know, it's, it's not the sturdiest, nor is it the most unsturdy thing I can imagine. But All right. <laughs> we we get there. I'm again on dry land. Beautiful. I've done my canopy walk. Off we go. Uh -huh. Oh, no, there's a second one. It's either, oh, no. you know, a thousand yards or 10,000 miles long. I can't see from one end to the next. I'm like. I love you, honey. I don't love you this much. I can't know. I was going to say. <laughs> so the guide oh, goes no. first, then Hannah, and then me. And I am only focused. My eyes are only focused on the far end, hoping to see, you know, before darkness, that there is a destination upon which right, we can land. Right. I'm not enjoying the view. I can't even bring myself to look left, right, or down, God forbid. Oh, my God, no. Those two get halfway across the bridge. And it's, you know, it's a rope bridge with slat wood footings. Right. And the guide says, this is a great place to stop and take pictures. Get out of here, man. <laughs> which, which Hannah's glad to do. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm lagging a bit behind them. And I said, here's the deal, guys. If you are stopped when I get there, I am curling into a fetal position. Right. And you will figure <laughs> out how to drag my sorry fat ass the rest of the way across this bridge. Oh, God, no. <laughs> so needless to say, they moved on after taking their requisite pictures. I got to the end and thinking, okay. Maybe I haven't exercised all my demons, but I've conquered something. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Except there was now a third one. No. Oh, no. Fortunately, it was very much like the first one. It wasn't near as long. I hot-footed it across that sucker, made sure there was not a fourth one on my perilous trip. Right, and right. Uh, <laughs> You guys might as well leave me here. <laughs> we were done. Now, now, let me take you to the end of that trip, just for kicks and giggles. We, we of course, visited Hannah's host family while we were there. And we visited twice, a couple days apart, two days before Easter. And then they invited us back for Easter dinner. And when we arrived on the first trip, um, there is they very proud of the goat they had just purchased that was staked in their front yard eating their grass. And they introduced us to the goat and... Isn't it wonderful that we have a goat? And you can imagine it was not uh, surprising when we returned on Easter and the goat was no longer staked in the front yard eating their grass, but uh, that was our the entree of our meal. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh man. When we were kids, my dad, every New Year's Eve, would make this big dinner for my mom. He would make, like, lobster dinner. But he would bring the lobsters out and let me and my brother, like, play with them on the kitchen floor. And then, like, <laughs> throw them into, like, the boiling pot. And it would be, like, 
Freddie, no. Like, you know. <laughs> Never name your food. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking, like, oh no, this poor goat. Oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's funny. So this is just an entire book of these absurd, <laughs> hilarious travel stories that you've compiled over your lifetime. Yeah. Um, where can people find it? Sure. It's available through Olive Publishing directly or any major online retailer like uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wild, wild, widely available. It is a small four by six inch travel size book. Perfect. That fits easily into all sorts of computer bag pockets. I also, with, with some seriousness and tongue in cheek, say it's a great bathroom book. It'll make whatever's <laughs> happening in in that room of your house much more enjoyable. Um, and it's not just stories of travel. There's little quips of, I, I pay a lot of attention when I'm traveling, especially in airports, and I hear weird stuff. And, you know, I'm a boy, and so you know there's a chapter on bathroom humor. Sure, sure. <laughs> Not the least of which is Hannah getting stuck on that trip to Rwanda on the first leg in the airplane's bathroom. But oh. you'll have to read about that. But I'm in, <laughs> I was recently, you know, in the last couple of years in uh, Washington, D.C., ready to fly home. I'm in the bathroom, minding my own business in a stall. What yes, happens all too often, people talking on their cell phones with flushing going on all around them. Right. And I hear this young boy yell out to his dad. Hey, Dad, you were right. If you shake it, more pee comes out. <laughs> you know, you can't make this stuff up. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so there's a lot of those little one-liner, one-paragraph things. Oh, I hang God. out in a fair number of airport bars where interesting conversations are had and overheard. And it's I'm a sure. it's a laugh a minute sort of thing in my opinion. It's it's humor filled if I can say so myself. Absolutely, I believe it, <laughs> Mike. This has been such a joy. <laughs> I'm glad. I've Where had fun. can we find you if people want to follow along in any of your future misadventures? <laughs> <laughs> they can certainly go to uh, to Facebook. I'm also on Substack. I need to get better at. Um, posting more on Substack, uh, but it's uh, Mike France, M-I-K-E-F-A-F-R-A-N-T-Z dot sub, Substack dot com. Perfect. I will certainly include links to all of your things in the episode show notes so people can easily find you. Thank you. I hope that once you make it over to uh, Alaska, you will come back and tell us about uh, what went wrong there. <laughs> yeah, what grizzly bear dragged what dead animal in front of us? Yeah, I, I, I might stay on the cruise ship and hope for the best. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care. You too. Bye-bye now. If you enjoyed this episode, the best way to show your support is to rate or review us on whatever platform you're listening. And if this episode left you feeling like you just had to be there, reach out to Kelly to start planning an adventure of your own. Don't forget to follow us at HadToBeThere203 on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And visit our website, www.HadToBeThere.net. Until next time, get out there and make your own had to be there memory.